So welcome to this seminar on the complexity of branching proofs with Daniel Dadush from CWI. So Daniel has done a lot of wonderful work in computational complexity theory. Uh, one of the things he's been thinking about is uh, integer programming and how to, you'll have to tell me if this is correct, Daniel, but how to somehow bring theory and practice a little bit more together and explain what's going on, how integer programming can be so successful, although it's dealing with NP hard problems. Um, and I guess today we'll hear a talk on some of the theory of proof system, sort of capturing what mixed integer linear programming solvers can do, maybe kind of, sort of, and I'll immediately leave the word to Daniel so that he can clarify and correct anything that I messed up. Please, we're very happy to have you here. Yeah, so thanks uh, a lot for the uh, introduction, Yako. So yeah, indeed, uh, I um, have been thinking about um, how to bring sort of theory uh, closer to what um, you know practice is able to do in the context of integer programming. Uh, I would say I'm perhaps a bit more of an optimizer uh, and less of a, a, a computational complexity uh, theorist. So this is a, a bit of a let's say an experiment in computational complexity for me. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, joint work uh, with my uh, student Samat uh, Tiwari. Um, and it's about um, what you can say uh, about the complexity of uh, a certain type of proof system for proving the infeasibility, integer infeasibility of, uh, of polytopes. So uh, let's uh, begin. Um, so the, the rough outline, I'm going to tell you uh, a lot about different types of proof systems for uh, proving integer infeasibility of, of polytopes um, uh, with a bit of a, a mix between uh, the view um, from optimization and the view um, in the context of uh, proving unsatisfiability of uh, CNF formulas. Um, and then the, the second part, which is, I guess, the more, uh, the, the bigger part of the paper and the more technical part um, is about um, sort of sanitizing um, the, the size or the bit size of branching proofs and showing that uh, they can be related uh, polynomial D to, to the length of the proof. We'll, we'll get into that. And lastly, we'll talk about uh, sort of uh, an accidental, uh, I would say, uh, result, um, which was um, uh, showing that that uh, a conjecture that was long held that that uh, cutting planes um, would have a hard time refuting uh, Saitin formulas uh, is apparently false, um, and this uses the relationship to branching proofs. Okay, so what is the main problem that, that we're interested in, uh, the task that we, we want to study. Um, so this is the task of showing uh, that a polytope um, that's given as a linear, explicit linear description uh, contains no integer points, right? So this is a kind of obvious uh, Cohen-P, you know, hard problem, um, but it has, you know, many, many applications. Um, and in particular, uh, showing the emptiness of, of, of polytopes is something that is in some sense done all the time uh, in the context of uh, integer programming. Um, and usually uh, when you're an optimizer, you're, you're less interested in, I mean, it depends, but you're, you're mostly less interested in you know, uh, showing that integer points don't exist. Um, you usually want to find uh, you know, good solutions to some combinatorial problem. Um, but of course, if you found the best solution and you want to prove uh, that you've uh, found the best solution to uh, you know, your combinatorial problem or your integer program, then this is exactly um, uh, proving that some uh, polytope uh, has uh, no solutions, namely you know, the polytope corresponding to you know, um, having a strictly better objective value than the current best found solution. Uh, subject to satisfying, you know, the constraints. And, you know, this kind of proving of optimality, if you, you know, stare at what happens in the context of integer programming solvers, you know, usually you have heuristics that do quite a good job 
of like finding either an optimal or possibly a very, very good solution, um, you know, quite early in the solution process. Uh, and then like the rest of the time is spent proving optimality. Uh, the bulk of the time is spent proving optimality. And this is done, you know, using a mixture of branch and bound, uh, which I'm, I hope many of you have heard of before, uh, and uh, cutting plants. Okay, so so this is this is something that indeed you know at least implicitly happens uh, uh, in all the time. So um, just to make clear, because you know I'm I'm speaking I guess more to SAT community today that um, you can obviously write uh, SAT as uh, an integer program, um, and uh, you know there is an obvious translation between. Um, SAT clauses and uh, linear constraints, uh, which you see here, you know, on the slide. Um, and so, if you can prove, you know, integer infeasibility of, of general polytopes, um, you can also prove uh, that a SAT formula uh, is unsatisfiable. Right. So these these problems, uh, you know, have very similar uh, complexity. Um, and so that that's an obvious uh, connection. Um, and in fact, you know, proof systems for for integer infeasibility and uh, you know proof systems for for unsatisfiability have kind of followed a very parallel track. Uh, things uh, kind of happened simultaneously. Um, so um, what what is called uh, variable branching, in the context of integer programming, in the context of satisfiability, is called tree-like resolution, um, and uh, these were, you know, let's say, roughly discovered at exactly the same time, uh, or or formalized at exactly the same time. Um, in the when we go forward to uh, what are called uh, cutting planes um, in the context of SAT, these are. Uh, what are known as cloth glomery cuts uh, if you're if you're an optimizer. Um, I would say these in fact appeared uh, earlier uh, in the context of optimization and were brought over and formalized into a proof system for SAT um, quite a bit later, actually with uh, you know the help of an optimizer who's William Cook. Um, and then uh, branching proofs, which is the subject of, of this talk, general branching proofs, um, has kind of been around for a while in the, in the context of optimization, um, but has not really been uh, formalized uh, into like a, a proof system that people have, have rigorously studied, uh, or at least studied a lot until recently. Um, and so, you know, this is why you have the, the reference to Beam et al. Uh, that, that plays a, you know, big role motivating what, what we're going to see today. Um, Bill, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So when you say branching proofs on the integer programming side, what, what is meant by that? I mean, is it like a, a proof system in the propositional proof complexity sense or something else? Or like, or what kind of theoretical investigations are made on these? Yeah, so so you you you'll see in uh, in a second, but basically, um, you know, there are algorithms for integer programming uh, that would come up, like um, Lenstra's algorithm for integer programming. Um, if you've heard of it, um, is really a branching proof, and uh, I mean it's exactly a branching proof. Um, and it, maybe they didn't call it. You know, specifically a branching proof, but it's uh, it's like a, an upper bound on you know the size of branching proofs for general integer programs. Um, the idea of branching on general disjunctions, uh, you know, using it in practice has been around uh, for a while, and using it in theory has been around for a while. But maybe the kind of precise formalization as a as a you know a proof system. Uh, and thinking about all the questions that one might ask when you say, you know, what is true about this proof system, uh, that perhaps was was less studied. Um, does that does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So we'll but we'll we'll get to these these results. Um, yeah. So so thinking, let's say, slightly more on 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 the. Uh, you know, IP viewpoint, how do these uh, proof systems work? 
Um, they're based on um, two very simple principles. Uh, the one being that if you take the, the inner product of two integer vectors, you will always get an integer output. Um, and the second is that if you have um, a problem that is infeasible over the reals, so a linear system that is infeasible over the reals, that you can certify the infeasibility and check the infeasibility in polynomial time. Um, and there is a, a succinct certificate of infeasibility, which is known as a Farkash certificate. Um, so if the polytope here you see is in question here is empty, you can um, always find uh, like a positive combination of the constraints um, such that uh, you know, the, the constraint side sums to zero um, and the, uh, the B side sums to something negative. Um, and so this is kind of like a trivial reason for uh, like infeasibility, because if you were feasible, this, um, you know, if any feasible X uh, uh, existed, um, it would not be possible to find such a combination just because, you know, um, uh, AX is less than or equal to B. So lambda AX should be less than or equal to, uh, you know, lambda times B and uh, zero cannot be, you know, less than something negative. Um, so, so the existence of these certificates uh, makes it easy, let's say, at least from a proof complexity perspective, to, to certify the uh, you know, infeasibility of a polytope over the reals. Um, so how does that you know, play out when you're, when you're doing, um, uh, when you're trying to actually build a, a proof of integer infeasibility? So the first thing that you can do, and this is you know, what people uh, did already you know, in the 60s, uh, is you can try and uh, branch on variables um, uh, where uh, uh, you, you know that if you're doing, if you have a zero one problem, um, you, your, your variables are either zero or one. Um, so if you choose a variable XI, you can you know, branch and fix it to be zero and fix it to be one. And you have two you know, recursive subproblems uh, that you need to worry about. And so you can keep making these branching decisions um, until you get uh, to uh, these uh, leaf nodes that you see at the bottom here, where the emptiness here is emptiness over the reals, right? So where the polytopes are actually empty. And at that point, you don't need to branch anymore because you know, your, your Farquhar certificate is already enough to tell you that you're done uh, if you're trying to prove integer infeasibility this way. So here's like a, you know, a simple, 2D example, every example will be 2D because I can't draw in higher dimension. Um, and uh, here you have uh, a zero one polytope, the corners are the, the zero one points. Uh, you can branch you know, on X1 and you see that if you branch left, so X1 equals zero, uh, you still have uh, feasibility over the reals, right? The polytope, this line segment is still feasible. So you would have to branch one more time uh, to get to uh, an infeasible system. But if you branch on the right, so X1 equals one, then uh, you're already infeasible. The polytope itself is already infeasible. And so, so here you, you, you maybe get a branching tree of size three uh, if you um, uh, start in this way, okay? So uh, now we've seen variable branching. So what are sort of general branching proofs? Uh, and what are these about? So this uh, just uses the, is, is working with a generalization that there's no reason for you to sort of branch on um, like variable disjunctions. You don't have to branch on you know, just x1 equals 0 or 1. You can branch on more interesting things. So in particular, uh, you could take any kind of integer vector a, and you could choose to branch um, on uh, you know, the following disjunction, either AX is less than or equal to B, or AX is greater than or equal to B plus one, right? So if A is integer and you're, you're worried about integer points, then AX is always integer. Uh, so clearly if B is, is an integer, you know, either AX is less than or equal to B or it's greater than or equal to B plus one, and this is always, you know, a valid dichotomy. And so now you can do a branching proof in exactly the same way, um, as with variable branching, except now you have more interesting disjunctions uh, that label the nodes. 
right? So the nodes will be labeled with um, the sort of branch direction, that's the A's. And then the edges will be labeled with, um, you know, the direction. So, uh, so with the, the right-hand side that's, that you're interested in. So you'll, your branch left means less than or equal to B and branch right means greater than or equal to B plus one. Okay. Um, and so now you do exactly the same thing. You somehow, you know, keep choosing branching directions um, until you get uh, to the leaf uh, nodes, which correspond to empty polytopes. Okay. Um, and now the, I guess maybe you see the polytopes can get much more interesting possibly, uh, you know, the, when, you, when, you, when you are allowed to branch in this way, you can sort of get pretty crazy polytopes at the, uh, in, the, in the intermediate stages. Uh, so somehow uh, maybe there's more richness or flexibility here that, that might be useful. Um, and here's just a small, you know, little illustration. Um, so if I were branching, um, you know, in the in the one one direction, um, I might get a disjunction that looks like this. This is branching on essentially, you know, x one plus x two is less than or equal to one, or x one plus x two is greater than or equal to two, and that would cut my polytope into two pieces: uh, the left piece and the right piece, and I would recurse on both. Okay. Um, so the next system uh, that will also play uh, a role for us and is very important is uh, what's known uh, as cutting planes uh, you know, in, in the context of, of, of SAT. Um, in the context of optimization, the cutting planes that are, that are looked at are just a, one family of cuts that, that, that are known to exist in the universe. Um, but they're still very important cuts and, and as optimizers, we love them and they're known as uh, quartal gomery cuts. And uh, so uh, what, what are quartal gomery cuts? What are cutting planes? Um, so you start uh, with any integer vector, um, you um, optimize uh, the integer vector over your polytope, right? So you have your integer vector A, uh, look at the maximum value that uh, maximum inner product that you get over your polytope, uh, call that B. Um, then you know that AX less than or equal to B is a valid inequality for uh, the actual polytope. But now when you uh, restrict to the integers inside this polytope, uh, it's actually valid to round the right-hand side B down to the nearest integer. Um, just because you know that AX will be an integer. So if AX is less than or equal to B, then AX is less than or equal to the floor, uh, the round down of D. Okay, and so if I give you uh, a vector A, we can now say that, you know, the, the quathar gomery cut, the Cici cut induced by A on my polytope P is exactly, uh, you know, AX less than or equal to the round down of the maximum value that it attains. Um, and so the cutting plane sort of proof system would just be, um, you know, iteratively choose, you know, the directions, uh, the cut directions that, that you want to use, uh, iteratively apply them until your polytope is empty. Okay, and uh, this, this would also yield like a valid proof of integer infeasibility. Uh, and it turns out that this is a, a special case of what you can do in branching proofs. Um, and this follows the kind of very simple kind of observation that um, this uh, a CG cut is sort of in one-to-one -one correspondence with a branch where one side of the branch is empty, right? So if you take a, uh, AX and B as we have above, um, if I branch on sort of AX greater than or equal to the floor of B plus one, uh, that polytope has to be empty, right? Just by construction. So sort of um, one side of the branch will be empty and the other side will be non-trivial. Okay, so you can always simulate a branching proof. Sorry, you can always simulate a cutting plane proof using branching um, of a very special structure where you have a branch where always one side of the branch is empty. Um, and just as an interesting historical note about like uh, these, these cuts, um, like possibly the first paper ever to show how awesome cutting planes were is this paper of uh, Danzig, Fulkerson, or Johnson, uh, where they essentially used CG cuts and maybe some other tricks um, to show that uh, a specific tour on a TSP tour on like 49 cities um, 
49 US cities was optimal and they did it using CG cuts and they did it by hand. Uh, and they have like a whole paper that explains, you know, how exactly they did it. And they sort of established, uh, you know, the methodology and IP of using cutting planes um, and, and showing that they can, you know, really be used to solve optimization problems. So yeah, just, just a nice, cute historical uh, aside. Um, yeah. Um, on this, if you go back, oh, Amir also had a question. Please, Amir. Um, so I have a small, it's a minor question, but in the beginning, part of the motivation was an open polit or uh, possibly. Uh, yes, polit yes, 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 so that's true. Yes, yes, good catch. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I guess. To be really different somehow. Uh, so that the open polytope is different? So if the, this polytope is open, then there is this, so the, the, you can't round it down. Like you, this is a problem you really need to solve in like. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I guess, um, yeah. So, so if, if, if your objective is like integer, then you can always like subtract one from opt uh, and then just show infeasibility of that polytope. And more often than not, I mean, th this does not end up being a problem, but yes, I mean, it is true that like the, the way I actually wrote it down, you have an open, a, a half open polytope. And you know, if you're not careful, maybe you run into issues, but, but most of the time, these are not really issues. Uh, you know, just like subtract one from the objective and you'll be fine. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 But yeah, good. Good catch. <laughs> um, so another question. You... So algorithmically, when you're talking about cutting planes, so the way we should think about this is it like there's some other procedure, presumably, that is like generating new inequalities to our polytope or taking linear combinations or doing something, and then we're like, uh, we get these new ax less equal b inequalities and then we use the cutting planes rule to somehow sharpen them further or yes so exactly. so yeah 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 so um uh in another yeah uh, kind of awesome historical side um so cutting planes almost came before branching um at least uh in in publication uh history uh so gomery um in like 1958 um, I guess he thought that like variable branching was too lame or something. Uh, and he came up with uh, a, a, an algorithm um, for, for IP uh, that, uh, you know, he proved was finite, um, you know, which was kind of an achievement. And, and essentially what it did is uh, it, it solved the, um, the LP relaxation of your IP um, using the simplex method, and in particular, the lexicographic dual simplex method. Um, and uh, from the optimal simplex tableau, you, you can actually derive uh, like valid CG cuts. Um, so you can, you can take the optimal vertex of your, of your LP and look at the whatever optimal simplex tableau, and you can derive a CG cut that kills the optimal vertex. Uh, for the current relaxation. Uh, and then you resolve the LP, you know, uh, add a new cut, resolve the LP, add a new cut, resolve the LP, add a new cut. Uh, and you showed that if you do this very, very carefully, um, you actually get a finite algorithm. Um, and, you know, okay, people uh, do do this uh, in practice, but they don't, you know, you don't add cuts until you've solved the problem completely. You sort of keep adding cuts uh, as long as it shrinks the like uh, the gap of your 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 or it, as long as you know some some something non-trivial happens like your upper bound or lower bound or whatever uh, decreases by some non-trivial amount and then when things stop moving that's when you start branching. Um, so so there are like ways of generating cuts usually starting from uh, optimal vertices of like your current LP relaxation. Um, and uh, that's that's what like gets used all the time in practice. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay.
Good. Um, so uh, geometrically speaking, what is the CG cut? Uh, so uh, here we have the same example. You start with your vector, uh, you know, the one one vector. You sort of maximize it um, over, you know, the current LP relaxation and you get the value of something like 3.71. Um, and then you learn that, um, you know, uh, x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 3 must be valid for all the integer points uh, inside your feasible region. Um, and that is your CG cut. OK. OK. So, so now uh, we can sort of start to get to, let's say, the, um, the meat of what uh, we ended up being uh, interested in in, uh, in this talk, um, in this paper which was uh, there are kind of two obvious ways to like, you know, measure the size of a proof. One is sort of, you know, the combinatorial measure of like how many steps uh, there are uh, in a proof. Uh, so if you're looking at, you know, a branching proof, you can think, you know, how many nodes are there in the branching tree? Um, or if you're looking at a cutting planes proof, um, it's how many cuts, okay? so. These are kind of the obvious notion, combinatorial notion of length. Um, and then there is uh, the, the actual bit size of, of the proof, um, which would be you know, the total number of bits you need to write everything down, including um, if you're doing a branching proof, um, the size of the bit size of all of the normals, the bit size if you're doing a CG cut uh, uh, proof, the size of all of the you know a vectors um, in 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 the proof. So so that gives you two different notions. Uh, let's say length and size. Okay, and there's the obvious question of like can these be related? Um, so we will we will get to that. But first, let's talk about um, what's what's known, and this relates uh, to Jakob's first question of like. Um, what was known in the context of optimization um, for branching proofs. Um, and okay, Leinster probably didn't use the word or did not use the word branching proof um, in his paper, but what his paper shows is that uh, if you have an infeasible, uh, integer infeasible compact compact set, uh, then there is always uh, like a branching proof of infeasibility whose size is uh, this flatness constant to the power n. Um, and the flatness constant, uh, I guess you can kind of maybe see uh, it, it in the slides, is if you have a, an in integer infeasible compact compact set, then there is always going to be some like branching direction such that the number of like parallel, you know, integer hyperplanes that intersect uh, the feasible region is bounded by um, a, a constant that depends only on dimension. Um, and the best bounds we have on this constant that depends only on dimension is n to the four thirds. So that's where this like n to the four thirds or n to the end, if you've seen these kinds of complexities would come up, you sort of have a polynomial number of branches per dimension um, and you have n dimensions that you need to kill. So that gives you these kind of n to the order n uh, size proofs. Um, and uh, uh, it turns out that, um, the same exact thing is true for cutting planes. Um, and this uh, was proven by uh, Coquillard and Turan, who basically showed that uh, you, can, you can take Leinster's proof uh, and serialize it uh, into a cutting plane proof. And this will be uh, very important in our kind of accidental result uh, in this paper. Uh, so we'll get to that at the end. Um, and uh, uh, so that, that's, let's say, what's known. Um, in full generality for general, let's say, convex sets. Um, and now there, there's this you know, question of like the two different notions of size. Um, and one of the main results in Kukulard and Turan was that you know, the, the kind of size in terms of bit description length of a cutting plane proof, you can actually show that it can be bounded by a polynomial in the length of the proof as well as you know, the bit size of the starting polytope. Um, and uh, Beam, Fleming, and Palizzo, Polkova, Punker, Tosi, and Rover uh, conjectured that something similar should be true for branching proofs. Um, so uh, they 
started, let's say, a more formal proof complexity theoretic analysis of the, this proof system. Um, and they got stuck at this question and were, were wondering, you know, if you could show that, you know, branching proofs um, can be sanitized in some sense in the same way uh, as uh, cutting plane proofs can. All right, so that uh, is, is they, they actually asked me this question while I was visiting um, um, uh, Tony and, and, and company um, in Toronto. Uh, I've worked a lot on these types of questions or questions related to, let's say, lattices. Um, I thought I would answer this question in an hour. It took me two years. Uh, so so it's, it, it, was, it was fun. So I'll, I'll now tell you what we figured out on that front. Um, just one question, though, if I'm making yeah. very important, maybe but I'm just confused whether I'm mixing the references up or something. The, the fact that um, if you have a cutting planes proof, then without loss of generality, uh, the coefficients are at most exponential in magnitude or in bit size at most a polynomial number of bits, I think is attributed to bus and clotter. Oh, I, I, I... 96, or is this some, or, or am I mixing up? Is this like something else? Oh, or I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that reference. Um, I mean, for sure, I can say that uh, Coulard and Turan had this as a main result. Uh, that that I, not exponential, uh, but that that you can assume that uh, it's polynomial. Uh, the coefficients are polynomial, and or you know have size two to the um, bit size of the polytope times. Uh, yeah, uh, I keep forgetting what the dependence is on the polynomial. Um, in, in the length of the, uh, of the proof. But uh, uh, yeah, maybe this, this second result that you mentioned had something more fine grain. Because um, like, uh, what is true about the Kukler and Turan result is that the, uh, the bit complexity um, like grows as the proof gets longer. Uh, you don't actually have like a, a length independent bound on the size of the coefficients, um, which is a bit uh, annoying actually. Uh, it's also an open problem. Uh, I thought, I know. Okay, I guess I guess I should know, but I have to acknowledge in embarrassment that I don't know how this is different from what Bus and Clote do. I guess we'll just have to. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I mean, uh, to be fair, yeah, these types of things of people proving things independently obviously happen all the time. So, so it could be it could be that kind of situation. Um, anyway, yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, so our, our real the main contribution, I'd say, or let's say the the main reason we wrote uh, the paper um, was to uh, answer the beam at all question, and and we showed that. Uh, indeed, uh, you you can um, sort of get polynomial size branching proofs, uh, and more specifically, um, you know what we show is uh, that if you give me any branching proof, um, then one can always recompile it um, so that um, all the normals uh, that are used in the branching tree are uh, reasonable. Um, so reasonable is this coefficient bound on the second bullet. Um, so it means that if you know that your polytope lies inside some sort of ball of radius R, uh, we use an L1 ball, but uh, whatever, um, you get coefficients of size n R to the n squared. Okay, so I mean, big, but, but polynomial. Um, and what's interesting is that this coefficient bound, in fact, is independent of however you know big the branching tree is. Um, and the second thing is that uh, the length of the proof, so the actual size of the branching tree, um, only grows by a factor of n. Okay, it doesn't stay exactly the same length. Uh, I think actually uh, Cook et al. Uh, managed to keep the proof uh, when they translate a CP um, to you know, bounded coefficient CP, uh, the length of the proof stays exactly the same. Uh, in our case, that's that's not true, uh, and that is also uh, the source of much pain and suffering. Um, so our proof grows by a factor of n, 
uh, and uh, uh, you get this like final coefficient uh, upper bound uh, in the third bullet. So branching proofs are same, um, which uh, is, I guess, the one of the first fundamental things you want to know about, you know, uh, any proof system. Um, but because, you know, IP people don't think in proof system, you know, in the proof system viewpoint, they never ask this question. Um, so that's our main result. Uh, so now I should tell you uh, some things about, you know, this main result. Um, and uh, uh, so let's, uh, let's think a little bit about what would happen if I had absolutely gigantic coefficients uh, in my branching proof. Um, oh, sorry. So I'm seeing that there are tons of things in the chat, maybe. Um, I, I don't think I should open the chat because everybody will see it. Uh, Jakob, can you tell me what's in the chat? No, no. I... Um... Oh, I guess. Okay. No, we were just discussing. We're a bit confused about this uh, Cook, uh, Collard, and Turan versus Bus and Clotte. And uh, we're not sure, but definitely one thing that Bus and Clotte have is that division by two is sufficient. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, with without loss of generality, if you're fine with losing a polynomial factor, and then the question is that maybe. Oh, and then there's a question. Maybe uh, Cook Cook and all talked about number of steps and not about the size of the coefficients. Uh, I guess no, we'll they... have to take it as homework. Okay. 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 Sounds good. Um, think, yeah. So. Okay. It's definitely right. the case that the bus and Clotta asked about, I mean, they managed to, I think the one question they are asking, which is open to this day, I guess, is for, for cutting planes, if I now insist on logarithmic number of bits for my coefficients. So meaning that they're now at mo of at most polynomial magnitude, am I losing something? I see, I see. Yes, and yes. that is still open and we don't know. I guess, the, I mean, probably, probably this is weaker, but we don't know. Yes, I see. Um, I see. So <clears throat> good. So 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 good. So uh, now, all right. Let me just say a few words about you know what could possibly happen if you you know have like gigantic coefficients. So um, you know mainly we're we're kind of worried about a having gigantic coefficients. Um, and if a has gigantic coefficients, then what you should see is that. If you're thinking kind of geometrically, then the space that is cut off, like in between, you know, uh, the stuff in between AX uh, being B and B plus one, um, gets uh, smaller and smaller in, in width. So like the, the kind of width of the band that gets cut off has, has uh, uh, width one over the magnitude of, of A. So if you use like really, really, really huge coefficients, you're kind of like cutting off tinier and tinier and tinier strips. And that might make you think that, you know, using huge coefficients might be a really stupid thing to do because, you know, like in this particular picture, you see what happens if you, um, you know, like sort of double the, the, the if, if you use um, like the two, two vector to index a cut versus the one, one vector, you know, the one, one vector will always be strictly better because the, the cut um, will be sort of twice as wide. Um, so this is some intuition of like, maybe it doesn't make sense to use gigantic coefficients. Um, and um, um, actually, I don't know if I want to do this. Um, do I want to show this? Yeah, actually, I think I want to show this example first before I get into any technical details. Uh, this sort of says that, you know, while it may be true that, um, if you use large coefficients, the width of what you cut off may be tiny. Um, it's, uh, it's not always true that width is what counts. Um, so here you kind of have an example, uh, a two-dimensional example of a really, really trivial IP. Um, it's basically this, uh, it's a lower dimensional uh, IP, which corresponds to this red line segment. Um, and you can see that, okay, it's lower dimensional. So, um, you know, uh, 
cutting it off with a, a, a kind of a, a branch of width zero um, or width close to zero is totally fine. Um, and, and the more sort of important thing to try and cut this thing off is really the kind of angle of the branch and not so much its width. Um, and this actually is really the, 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 the tension, uh, it turns out, um, in, in, in terms of having gigantic coefficients or not. It's that these, um, these angles can end up being more important than the widths. And here, this is kind of an example where, um, you know, okay, it's built so that um, if you branch on the kind of m comma one direction, um, which is almost uh, sort of vertical, um, or almost, you know, the normal is, is almost parallel to the, to the x-axis, um, then you can easily cut, you know, the whole region off with one branch. Um, but if you use anything smaller, sort of uh, coefficients that are slightly smaller, um, you will not be able to do this in one step. Like this, this branch kills the entire region off in one step. But if you use um, smaller coefficients, you won't be able to do it in one step. And the reason is very simple is that you have this integer point. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Yes, we can. Yes. So you have this integer point here, right? This is the, the, the zero one point, which is super close to the feasible region to the real feasible region. So sort of any, any branching direction that you try and use will have like an integer hyperplane that passes through exactly this point, okay? And you can sort of see that unless you get the angle exactly right, um, any kind of integer hyperplane that passes through this point is going to cut through the feasible region. Um, and that will mean that, you know, uh, uh, I mean, this isn't a difficult IP, but it, it will mean that you know, with small coefficients, you cannot kill this in one step. Um, and this is sort of very, very easy to, easy to show, and it's really because of this point. Um, what will happen in our case is that you know, we'll do like the first obvious thing. We'll sort of notice that this branch is almost kind of perpendicular. Um, so we'll branch first on, you know, let's say x1, um, x1 being uh, you know, let's say between, uh, okay, let's say x1 being one or zero or minus one. Um, these two branches will be empty. This third branch will have only one point on it. And then after that will be done. I mean, or it's like very easy to finish after that. But at least you sort of see that if you're really like worried about keeping length exactly, uh, you cannot do this uh, with small coefficients. Um, Okay, and th this is, let's say, something new that doesn't show up uh, in, uh, in the, the, the cutting plane uh, proof situation. So here, if you want to keep the length exactly the same, you can have unboundedly large coefficients, like there is no bound. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so you have to do something. Um, and, um, you know, so what is the kind of mathematical tool that, you know, people use um, if I give you a, you know, a vector and I want to kind of approximate the direction of this vector uh, using um, uh, an integer uh, vector that's not too huge. Uh, and this is a sort of simultaneous Diophantine approximation or Dirichlet theorem or, or it has many, many different names. Um, and essentially it says that you can, you know, get quite good approximations of the direction of any vector uh, you know, using a small integer vector. And the, the formalization that we end up using is, is written here. Um, so if you have like, uh, a, you know, a vector uh, A that's non-zero, um, this alpha here is used to scale it so that it has infinity norm one. Um, and then there will be some integer scaling of, of A uh, such that um, it's very close uh, to an actual integer vector, and that actual integer vector will be uh, this, you know, L, a scaling of L a over alpha, uh, rounded up or or down depending on what the nearest uh, like integer is to all of the coefficients. Um, and this is the type of guarantee that you get. Okay, so this is like the main tool, um, and uh, you know, as 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 we said. 
I mean, you could hope that if you take your um, your branch AX greater or equal to B or less or equal to uh, greater or equal to B plus one or less or equal to B, if you apply a Diophantine approximation um, and you sort of replace the branch by, by kind of something approximately uh, equal to it, um, then, you know, uh, as long as, you know, you're within some, some bounded feasible region, you can kind of hope that the new branch is kind of strictly better than the old one. Um, <clears throat> And uh, this is what strictly better would, would kind of look like, that sort of what was cut off before uh, is strictly contained in what is cut off now. Uh, and this indeed would be, you know, mainly because, you know, the branch can be much wider. Um, but as I showed in, in this example, sometimes, you know, the direction of the branch is much more important than its width. And this, this kind of domination, like, will never happen. Okay. So let me say a few words about, uh, I, th I think I'll skip a few slides, um, but let me say a few words about, you know, what, what can we do to like fix, fix this problem? So it's not that, you know, you can take, you know, any branching decision in your branching tree and just replace it by a better one uh, that uses small coefficients. It's just not true and, and you have to live with it. Um, and so what do we, what do we kind of do? Um, we basically take a branching tree that we're trying to recompile. We very, very carefully, and here I mean very, very, very carefully, replace um, all the branches by approximate ones that we uh, build using some iterated version of that Fantine approximation, which I'll say a few words about. Um, and then even after we've been so careful with our Diophantine approximation, um, we still won't have the answer right. So um, what happens is that if you get to the bottom of the tree, so here's, here's your original tree, okay? So, you know, you can think, I'm going to take all of these branching decisions and replace them by approximate ones. Uh, so I do that. And I use my fanciest fancy approximation. You know, I do uh, fancy things like this. But then, um, whereas in the previous branch, you know, branching tree, we knew that all of the leaves were you know, infeasible polytopes. Uh, now um, I only have like approximate versions of the inequalities um, that you kind of pick up uh, at the bottom. And now it's totally unclear like whether the leaf polytopes are empty anymore. And in fact, they will be non-empty uh, as you know, the previous, uh, this like simple 2D example uh, shows. Um, so they will be non-empty, this is a problem. Uh, so you have to uh, fix them up somehow. And, you know, the real issue that you kind of come up with is that, you know, in essence, you have to be really, really sure that your leaf polytope uh, that, that used to be empty um, and now is not empty, um, that is not, you're not just like solving like a general integer program, right? Like uh, uh, you, you have to somehow convince yourself that, you know, what the problems that you have with the leaves are somehow simple. Um, and this unfortunately is, is, is quite non-trivial to, to, to kind of achieve. Um, so um, what, what we do show is that if you do your Diophantine approximations very, 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 very carefully, um, then you can guarantee that the leaf polytopes, even though they might be non-empty, that there is like a sequence of order n CG cuts or equivalently a branching tree of like size order n um, that kills them completely. And we can set things up in such a way that like you can apply like the CG cuts uh, to each leaf polytope uh, kind of in pairs uh, and these will reduce dimension by one uh, at, every, at every iteration. Um, so I just wanna say like one thing about why this is possible at all. Um, and this is like my, possibly my favorite technical lemma, um, which sort of tells you, you know, um, why you might have any hope of, you know, uh, you, you kind of started, let, so, so let me give the setup of the sum up. So this P here, you can think of it as like, what used to be a leaf polytope uh, at the bottom of the branching tree. So you don't have P at the bottom of a branching tree once you've replaced all the branches by their approximations. You have something that looks like this, 
you have some sort of p epsilon where uh, every constraint is perturbed by something different. Um, and you have very little control over you know, what these perturbations really are. Um, so, so you have to have some hope that tells you that, okay, maybe even for this perturbed polytope, I have to be able to say that it's somehow close to being integer infeasible. Uh, and what you can say in complete generality is that if you have this perturbed polytope, um, and if it happens to be non-empty, then there is always exactly one constraint um, that if I improve the error, so the constraint had error epsilon, if I improve the error from being epsilon to being sort of much better than what I needed, so uh, epsilon equals zero is uh, sort of, you know, what it would mean for the constraint to be unperturbed. But if I, if I tell you that actually not only can I get, you know, I can um, improve the error to be on that constraint to what it should be, you know, in the original polytope, but I can go kind of like n times past that. Um, so this is this like uh, encoded by this n plus one epsilon i. So I kind of, not only do I improve the error, but I make it kind of n times better than I needed it to be. Then by improving this one constraint, I can make the polytope empty. Right. So it sort of says that as long as I can, um, um, as long as I have control um, in, in the sense of being able to take any inequality in my leaf polytope, and uh, uh, if I have the ability to improve the error by kind of a factor of n uh, in the kind of opposite direction, um, I can make the polytope empty. So this is a very nice kind of, it's actually very simple to prove. Uh, and, and this is really the main reason why anything is possible. Um, uh, and okay, so, so um, maybe I will, interest of time, I'll skip a bunch of this stuff. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I can talk about it more during the kind of more technical part if people are interested in, uh, in it, but, but essentially, you know, what do we, what do we do to, to do these Diophantine approximations? We use like a fancy iterated version of Diophantine approximation, um, which uh, uh, has to be done very, very carefully. Um, and uh, this allows us uh, to kind of um, be able to have the power to improve the error um, on any constraint that we want uh, in the leaf polytopes. Um, and when you kind of combine it with this lemma, uh, it, it allows you to reduce damage. Um, so I'm going to skip uh, the rest of this stuff um, and talk now about uh, the second, I would say, uh, result, um, which was um, about Satan formulas and um, sort of refuting a conjecture that they should be hard um, for, or very hard uh, for cutting planes. Um, so uh, what are Satan formulas? So uh, Satan formulas, are uh, CNF formulas that are built from uh, linear equations mod two. So you start with a graph. Um, it should have uh, some bounded maximum degree, like five. Um, and you take any odd set of odd subset of nodes. And what you set up is you set up an infeasible system of linear equations mod two. Uh, which basically looks at the, the parity of uh, the sum of the edges outgoing from any vertex. Okay, so you basically say that um, you want, um, so you have to assign zero, one to each, uh, each edge. And you basically say that, you know, the, out, the sum of the outgoing uh, arcs around a specific node um, should be either even or odd, depending on whether uh, the vertex um, is inside uh, the, the, the set W or not. Um, and uh, you know, what happens is that uh, because, uh, actually, how does this get written? Yeah, uh, because uh, you, know, you, you chose the sum of the parities to be, to be odd. Um, so basically the set W is odd. Um, but you know that you know, if, you, if you sum all the parities over uh, the edges of a graph, you kind of count each edge twice, 
Uh, so the sum of the parities um, over, over all of the, the constraints has to be even. Okay, so you set up like a trivial, you know, infeasibility this way. Um, and now to, to, to make, you know, life difficult, you, you kind of encode this linear system mod two uh, as a CNF formula. All right, and this encoding, um, you know, basically needs to take, you know, every uh, linear constraint mod two and turn it into um, a, a whole bunch of CNF clauses. Uh, and, you know, this transformation is not terribly uh, efficient. Um, so basically for every vertex, the corresponding, you know, CNF formula for that, you know, one vertex has size two to the delta, roughly where delta is the maximum degree. So you should have maximum degree that's like bounded or, you know, at least uh, logarithmic, um, you know, to, to, to keep the size of this formula under control. Right, so these are kind of trivially uh, unsatisfiable formulas um, for, for these kind of parity uh, constraint reasons, but apparently parity is hard for, you know, things like resolution and whatnot uh, to see. Um, and so these were kind of used initially by Zeitin to show lower bounds on, uh, I, I think, uh, I can't remember which version of re resolution, um, but some version of resolution. Um, and then at some point it was conjectured that Saitin formulas should also be hard for cutting planes. And this, this conjecture um, has been around for a while uh, since essentially the work of Coulard uh, and Turan. Um, and in, in uh, 2018, Beam et al. Um, came up with a branching proof uh, that was quasi polynomial size uh, for its Saitin formulas. Uh, and what they thought they had found was um, kind of evidence that branching proofs are kind of strictly better than cutting plane proofs. Um, and so they thought that, you know, this was like a motivation of why branching proofs, you know, are awesome and, uh, uh, you know, somehow give a separation uh, of what you might expect to be able to do with, with cutting planes. Um, and so what we showed is that, uh, in fact, um, the proof that uh, Beam et al. came up with um, for branching proofs uh, can be converted into a cutting plane proof um, directly. Uh, so, so there is, uh, as of yet, no separation between uh, uh, branching proofs and cutting plane proofs. And in particular, you get that site and formulas have uh, you know, quasi polynomial size cutting plane proofs. And the proof that, that we found is really like in two steps. Uh, and this is why I, I say it's kind of an accident because I was uh, reading, you know, the Beam et al. paper and I was reading Cook et al. and I managed to put two and two together and this is what two and two gives, which is that um, Beam et al. showed that branching proofs have quasi polynomial size, uh, you know, proofs for, for its Saitin formulas. Cook et al. Um, showed that uh, you can essentially serialize the special kind of branching proof that uh, is used in the Beam et al. paper. Um, and it's, it was basically a result that they proved to show that Lenstra's algorithm um, provides uh, bounds on the lengths of cutting plane proofs for, um, uh, for general compact convex sets. Um, so, so we really just like combined two results that, you know, where the second one was maybe a bit more implicit or more difficult to kind of extract from the original paper, but you put it together and you get that certain formulas have quasi polynomial size proofs. Um, and what, you know, just a few words of like what these special proofs, uh, kind of branching proofs look like that are not completely general branching proofs. Um, so they, they, they look like um, 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 branching proofs where essentially in, if, I, if I pick a branching direction, um, instead of, you know, branching on kind of AX or equal to B or AX greater or equal to B plus one, what I'm really going to do is I'm going to branch on all possible values of AX that um, AX can have over the feasible region. Okay, so, so I'm going to sort of branch on all possible values immediately. Um, and uh, all of the um, sub problems that I get will be lower dimension. Right, so here is kind of an example of what that might look like. Um, you sort of have uh, a one x, you know, that you 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 know 
On the feasible region, A1X takes values between zero and 2.5. Like this, you can certify using uh, like uh, solving two LPs. Uh, and then you branch on A1X equals zero, A1X equals one, A1X equals two. Okay, and you do it in order. Um, and then as you go down the tree, you do the same type of thing. You pick um, you know, a new uh, branching direction and you branch on all possible intermediate values um, until you get to uh, the leaves, where now the leaves don't exactly have to be empty, empty, but they just have to correspond to um, you know, um, being in between like two integer hyperplanes. So here, you know, you see on the bottom right, the leaf node is labeled by a6x is between 0.4 and 0.3. So like clearly it's integer infeasible, right? Because uh, ASIC, uh, there are no integers between 0.3 and 0.4. So th this is like also a proof of integer infeasibility. Um, so that's what an enumerated branching proof looks like. And uh, what uh, Cook et al essentially showed at least implicitly uh, is that if you take any such proof, um, you can, in fact, translate it uh, into um, a cutting planes proof. And it's, it's essentially you, you do a kind of in-order traversal of the, uh, of the branching tree um, where you, you kind of always, um, let's say, traverse the tree from, uh, from right to left. Um, and you kind of carefully add a cut every time you see uh, you traverse an edge or you visit a new node. Uh, and the main thing is that when you kind of, you know, traverse the tree in this, in this very careful way, all of the kind of inequalities that, that, you know, you're trying to add to the polytope are all kind of on the boundary of the current polytope. So they really can be related to CG cuts. Um, okay. And uh, you know, the last thing is that indeed this like proof of Beam et al is an enumerative branching proof. Um, and very, very roughly like the idea of their, of their um, um, proof um, to, to try and, and, and show that, that you know, a Cytin formula is infeasible um, is to take you know, the graph that induces the Cytin formula, cut the vertex set in half, um, and uh, sort of enumerate over the, um, like, let's say the number of arcs uh, that are used uh, in, the, in the solution that cross the cut. So in this case, you would enumerate over the possibilities 0, 1, 2, and 3, because that's the number, the maximum, that's all possibilities for the number of edges that you could use that, that, that cross the cut. And then once I know how many edges cross the cut, I can actually convince myself that either sort of V1 or V2 contains a contradiction. Um, just by staring at the modular uh, equations, um, you know, if you, you sum all the equations in V1 and you sum all the equations in V2, as long as I know the number of edges uh, crossing the cut, I can determine whether you know, one or the other sum contains a contradiction. Um, and that allows you to kind of uh, recurse on one or the other side. So uh, the, when, you, when you're branching, you kind of have to branch um, on at most like n squared different possibilities, which corresponds to uh, the number of edges crossing the cut. Um, but then you cut the number of variables uh, uh, in half um, in the next uh, recursive iteration. So this is where you get this like n to the log n uh, style dependence. All right, so that's uh, all I wanted to say. Um, in terms of open questions, um, you know, in, in our coefficient bound for, for branching proofs, we get like a reasonable but still pretty large coefficient bound that's like two to the m squared uh, or n to the m squared. Um, and the question is whether you can get that down to something more reasonable like n to the m, which would basically be optimal. Um, there's uh, also the question of having any reasonable or interesting um, lower bounds on the size of, of branching proofs for um, reasonable classes of CNS formulas. Um, so we have lower bounds, but they're only for like one formula which has all possible clauses. 
So that's not very interesting because the number of clauses is already exponential. Um, and there is also a question that's more motivated from the side of integer programming, which is um, whether uh, there are um, sort of compact convex sets which require branching proofs of sizes uh, n to the n. Um, and, and that would essentially prove the optimality of, of, of Lenstra's uh, algorithm for a restricted class of integer programming algorithms. Okay, so that's, that's, that's it. Thank you, Daniel. So do we have any questions at this point, point before we take a break? Let's see if anyone, I don't see anything in the chat, but people are welcome to just unmute themselves and speak, or if you have any comments or anything. Um, Maybe I can ask a, a question. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's something that you said in the beginning um, that I'm just, uh, it's intriguing that when you try to solve this in real life, you said that uh, quite early the optimization produces good solutions. Yes. But then to actually verify that it's good is the, the hard thing to do. Uh, um, yes. This seems like, uh, is there some, <laughs> uh, it seems the wrong uh, way to use the resource, like. Uh... Ah, yeah, I mean, okay. I, I, I guess, I mean, um, you, yeah, so, so you could just like, uh, well, okay. So the point is heuristics, you know, um, for finding good solutions are, are have, a, have an easier time getting lucky than the proof system does. Um, and, uh, it, it's true that you know if you knew that you had like this awesome solution, um, you know maybe maybe you would just stop um, and not uh, spend all this time proving optimality. But I, I think there is kind of this you know thing in OR where you kind of you know want to convince your customer that they couldn't do any better. I don't know. Um, and it is also true that you know the heuristics. Uh, you know, are kind of meshed in with uh, the the branching um, system. Like uh, the the heuristics and branching kind of play off of each other uh, in a way. So it is true that if you have like a, a good way of like proving optimality, that it kind of helps the heuristics at the same time. But but still, uh, the the vast amount of work that's 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 done in an IP solver. Uh, is proving optimality. So, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's really mostly the fact that it's easier to get lucky with uh, finding, you know, the optimal solution than it is to get lucky proving that the solution is optimal. So I guess it's just, a, maybe there is just a huge gap between theory and uh, like what goes in, Yes. But is there any chance to you know, to, to say something on trivia on the type of problems that lead to this situation or? Uh, so, okay, so what is known is, uh, and actually, so this made me quite happy, it's quite recent. Um, so last year, um, someone found, uh, so uh, good friends of mine at Georgia Tech actually uh, found a, a connection between um, the size of uh, branch and bound trees and integrality gaps, um, but only for kind of random classes of, of IPs. And, and this allowed them to show that for random packing IPs, um, that the, uh, with not too many constraints, so like M constraints or, or something. So imagine way more uh, variables than there are constraints. Then there's like a, a, a branch and bound takes time that's like N to the power two to the M, something, something like this. But so, 
so, so here I, I should say the kind of fundamental first issue is to get any sort of uh, bound on the size of a branching tree. Um, and uh, you, you, you know, before you talk about, you know, heuristics being lucky, well, okay, maybe you could talk about heuristics being lucky, uh, even if you have no control over the size of the branching tree. Um, but more generally, we have very few results that give us, you know, any control on the size of the branching tree. Um, and, and the one that I just mentioned is one of the very few uh, that do that. Uh, for a reasonable class of items. Thank you. So can, can I make a question? Mm -hmm. you still have time? Okay. Um, so uh, I just a couple of questions uh, on this uh, enumerative models that you were introducing. If uh, mm -hmm. uh, are you expecting that uh, some sort of separation between uh, the usual method and the enumerative uh, one. And another question is that uh, if you think uh, that there is any trade-off, uh, uh, some interesting things between this, uh, the depth and uh, the interval, the, the maximal interval, size interval you are using in the enumerative models, uh, are you expecting any things there or not? Yeah, so no, there, there is a lot going on there. Um, so the, this enumerative uh, kind of formalization is, um, I'd say exactly what happens uh, in Leinster's algorithm, like Leinster's algorithm exactly follows this pattern uh, where, um, and the depth in Leinster's algorithm is exactly dimension. Um, so, so you really have like, um, an enumerative branching proof where um, at every node, the number of branching decisions you make is polynomial in dimension and the depth is exactly dimension. Um, so, so this is, let's say, you know, what was proven on the upper bound side, theoretically. Um, and we, you know, we don't actually have, uh, uh, um, right, so, uh, so that's, that's, that's one first thing. If you try and convert this to a, if you try and convert it to a cutting plane proof, the cutting plane proof will have like maximal depth, right? Uh, or almost, almost maximal depth, um, because somehow you do like an in-order traversal of the tree, and like all of the cuts that you add may depend on most of all of the previous cuts. Um, so, so you may get, if you take Lanster's algorithm, you may basically get a, a, a proof where the depth is like equal to the length. Um, it's not clear to me, you know, uh, what trade-offs are possible, but clearly, you know, maybe something in between, interestingly in between, uh, uh should be, should be, should be possible. Um, but I, it's very kind of unexplored territory. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So there's a question in the chat whether it's known uh, whether clique coloring formulas are easy or hard for branching proofs. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, I, my vague suspicion is that it's, it's, it's not known. Um, and uh, uh, Okay, I'm not an expert on this, but it had to do something with the fact that like, you know, these clique coloring uh, formulas, everything is based on sort of, you know, this like monotone circuit lower bounds, or I guess there's some connection to communication complexity, which I always get confused about. Um, and apparently that, that connection doesn't help you at all with branching proofs. Like somehow there's no uh, useful monotonicity uh, to take advantage of. So I think somehow like the, the main tool that's used to prove the lower bounds somehow doesn't apply. And, and then I think people just don't know what to do. So uh, I, yeah, so if we're advertised, I think in a couple of weeks from now, I'm blanking on the date, but we're, I think that your result has been extended to, to something along the lines that if I have a, this 
branching proof or, or, or a stubbing planes proof and the coefficients are small, then cutting planes can perform the proof with yes. a, both a quasi polynomial overhead. Yes, yes, now that sorry. That if you have unrestricted cutting planes and you have exponential lower bounds for that, then you also have exponential lower bounds for stabbing planes with small coefficients, which yes. I guess would mean that if click coloring formulas are easy for full-blown stabbing planes, that for some reason that's because of wild coefficients. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, that is a very good point. Yes, yeah, so uh, good. And that's good advertising for, for the next talk, yeah. So, I mean, I guess, I think you would even get something non-trivial if you could show that the coefficients in the branching proof were like suitably sub-exponential. Um, so, so if you can get the coefficients to be of size, maybe two to the n to the epsilon or something, um, uh, what Jakob said, if I vaguely remember, might, might give something non-trivial in terms of a lower bound. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, like, yeah, coefficients can, can be wild. Uh, and already, you know, to tame them at all was a bit tricky. So yeah, uh, I mean, it's a very good question. It's apparently on uh, May 10th. Um, Noah Fleming is giving a, a talk on a paper by the Toronto crowd and, and some others. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions before? Oh, yeah. So Noah, Noah did ask uh, whether the wild coefficients kind of help. So already, like, uh, yeah, so so in an asymptotic sense, we don't know. Uh, of course, I mean, the kind of example that I showed, you know, the trivial 2D example that I showed sort of says, you can't exactly preserve length uh, with small coefficients. And if you want to exactly preserve length, there is no bound on the size of coefficients. But apart from that, I don't have like an, an asymptotic separation, no. I actually didn't see that Noah was here. Noah, since you're here, any do you anything you want to add, comment on this discussion or what we discussed before? Uh, do you mean just related to like the click co click? Well, yeah, or, or whatever in general, or clear up this bus clot uh, cook at all confusion, or I don't know. Uh, I think I might have missed the uh, um, bus conversation. What would you be able to summarize it for me? Oh, what did they prove compared to Coquillard and Tehran? Bus? I'm not familiar with this paper, I don't think. <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, neither was I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but for, uh, for is, it, is it clear, like, anything that you, your paper that you're talking about, May 10th, would say that anything is exp anything exponentially hard for cutting planes could only be easy for stabbing planes due to some extremely nifty use of coefficients. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the coefficients would have to be huge in order to uh, work for stabbing planes. Um, yeah, so I think that's a really interesting problem. Like, can you, can you even come up with any example where you need yeah, I mean, high coefficients? It might be very helpful to to look at. I, I think maybe one. Oh, okay, I'm not sure. I suspect maybe in the context of SAT, it might be difficult to find an example. But like, you know, if you already have like an, uh, a problem where let's say numericality is sort of part of it. So look at like knapsack, for example. Mm -hmm. Then you might you might you might be able to to do something. So like. Uh, there is this like paper of Rothfoss and Sanita that um, shows that, okay, some slight perturbation of a knapsack polytope has maximal CG rank, which, uh, which is uh, N squared. Um, and that is because, you know, of crazy numericality. Um, so it could be that, that, you know, if you kind of expand uh, your viewpoint to kind of include problems that, that, that have numerics kind of inbuilt, that then you might find uh, uh, more obvious examples of where crazy coefficients would help. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it would be even interesting like outside of uh, direct CNF formulas. 
yeah. uh, whether this would work. Okay, so why don't we take a 10 minute break? Sounds good. Enough to grab a cup of coffee or whatever you need and then we'll be back. Sounds good. So we're back after the break and uh, Daniel, you'll tell us about the menu. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, here I'm kind of listing three uh, possible things. Um, I think I do want to go through the first one because it's very simple uh, and, uh, and, and, and and cute. But so I, I can talk about an easy lower bound, but this is only for, uh, you know, the, the formula with uh, all possible kind of set constraints. Um, and this is actually an interesting, uh, you know, connection between uh, what IP researchers have been looking at and what um, um, SAT research have been looking at, but but somehow that there's a disconnect between the two, and I can explain that. Uh, second thing, I thought I could show a little bit about you know the analysis for these um, uh, for showing that the the the, the leaves of you know the modified branching trees um, you know can be made empty. I th just some of the cute lemmas there, uh, and then I could say something about the you know, the kind of uh, how you lift CG cuts and convert enumerative branching proofs, um, you know, that was kind of implicit in the Cook it all paper. Um, so maybe I'll just show the first thing and then you can, you know, people can chime in about uh, whether they, they want to see two or three um, or what they want to see. Yeah. Um, so, so the easy lower bound, um, you know, um, is, you know, you look at uh, the formula, which has like all possible clauses on length n, right? So um, the corresponding polytope is, you know, x in, in, in 0, 1 to the n, such that, um, okay, the sum of i in s of uh, xi plus the sum of one minus i uh, i not in s uh, is greater than or equal to one. Is that right? Yes, for all s subset of n. Okay. Um, so so these are uh, all possible. Uh, possible kind of n set clauses. Um, and, you know, the claim is that uh, sort of any branching proof uh, has length uh, two to the n over n. Um, so uh, just to be clear, like uh, each clause kills kind of exactly one assignment. Um, so I think this uh, 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 kills, uh, you know, the, the indicator of the complement of S or something. Is that right? Um, yes. I think the way I wrote it, that's that's that that's what happens. Um, so each each clause kills exactly one integer zero one assignment, um, and the claim is that any uh, branching proof um, that proves infeasibility of of this polytope uh, has exponential exponential size. But of course, you know the formula already has exponential size. It's a very simple formula, though. So so there, it's 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 not like you know this is the most uh, difficult formula in some sense in the world. But what's interesting here um, is that um, I would say SAT people think this is uninteresting uh, because it has an exponential number of clauses. On the other hand, um, on the IP side, uh, you will see tons of papers where this is like the only example that they care about. And the reason that in, in, in the IP context, this is kind of considered interesting is because you can embed this example in all sorts of combinatorial uh, situations. 
Um, so you can embed this as part of a TSP. You can embed this in like a, a stable set. You can embed this kind of problem uh, in, in, in lots of different kind of NP hard uh, uh, problems where maybe, you know, the, you know, the, the problem is a bit implicit. So, so, you know, the number of inequalities that, that are present in the problem is always exponential. Um, but it's, these inequalities are all implicit. So, so somehow in the IP context, people were okay with these kind of lower bounds because they're always working with hard problems to begin with. Uh, so they haven't like done the same amount of work as in the SAC community of finding sort of simple formulas, which are hard. Um, so I, I think it's like interesting that there's this kind of difference in, 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 in viewpoint, um, you know, there. And, and there could be like lots of work to be done to find, you know, like simple instances of combinatorial problems uh, where you have interesting lower bounds uh, as opposed to, you know, like instances of very hard combinatorial problems that have lower bounds. It's a bound um, uh, uh Yeah, so actually this was improved. I think two to the two to the n is is the is is uh, is is correct, um, and this was um, uh, okay. I think Day, Molinaro, and Dubé, um, like from this year. So I think they they kind of took this kind of, this this proof and like killed the log the the n slack. Um, I haven't actually read their paper, but um, so so it really is like two to the end, basically. Um, so, but there's an easy proof that gives you uh, two to the end on the log end, um, and this this proof is is basically an adaptation already of an idea. This is the idea of Kukulord and Turan. I mean, this is a very old idea. Um, uh, which is, uh, I guess, formalized in the context of criticality. Um, which says that if you remove one constraint, right? If you remove one constraint, uh, then it's uh, integer feasible. Then there exists uh, a solution. Right, and and that's just because you know each constraint kills exactly one uh, integer solution, um, and only that integer solution. Um, so so if you remove that one integer constraint, so if I remove the constraint associated with S, uh, then the complement of the indicator of the complement of S um, is is now feasible. Okay. So, so you have this kind of critical system where if you delete any one constraint, uh, a, a, new, a zero one solution pops up. So, so what does that mean? That means that you know, the, the proof, uh, the branching proof, the branching proof must use every constraint. Right, so so it must be that that the the, the branching proof has to somehow touch uh, every single constraint in the system, because if it didn't, uh, you know, it would be a valid proof for, you know, the system with one constraint deleted, uh, but that system would be integer feasible. So so somehow the branching proof has to see and touch every single constraint, right? So how do you um, how do you show that? You know the branching proof uh, needs to be big to touch every single constraint, right? Uh, so let's look at it. So here's the branching tree. Branching tree. And so you have your node. It's it. So here it, it turns out that we like really don't care about anything uh, related to coefficients. Uh, so maybe this node is empty. This node is empty. Uh, whatever. Uh, empty, 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 empty. Okay, something like this. Um, 
it doesn't matter what it is. Um, so let's, so we're just gonna prove that the number of leaves, okay? So we'll show that the number of leaves is bigger than two to the n over n. Uh, and why is that? So let's look at some leaf, right? So you have like a, uh, a1, oh, there shouldn't have been three branches. Okay. Uh, okay, let me, okay. Uh, let me say that this, this leaf is empty. So, okay, this is, a, 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 you know, less than or equal to B1, greater or equal to B1 plus one. Uh, and let's take the leaf going on the right. Uh, yeah, plus two, plus two, plus one, et cetera. So let's look at say this polytope. Uh, polytope. Um, so this leaf polytope, let's call it, um, um, so this is some node V, uh, let's call it PV, what does it look like? What does it look like? It looks like something like this, CX less than or equal to B. These are, uh, uh, or let's say D. Uh, these are the uh, original constraints. And then you have, um, uh, let's say, uh, AX less than or equal to B. Here I'm just writing things, uh, you know, after I've normalized. And these are uh, each row, these are the constraints picked up. Uh, you know, down down the tree, right? So it would kind of uh, um, in in this context, it would be you know this constraint, this constraint, and this constraint uh, would appear here. Okay, and and now the question is, um, what does it mean again for this uh, polytope to be empty, right? Um, it means that there is a Farquhar certificate. Right, so we know that PV is equal to, uh, we know that PV is empty. So that means that there exists a certificate of infeasibility. Uh, there exists a far crash certificate. Um, and, uh, uh, okay, so, so, so what does the far crash certificate look like? Um, uh, it looks like maybe some, uh, okay, C transpose, let's say gamma plus uh, A transpose uh, lambda sort of equals zero. Um, and uh, uh, such that uh, D transpose uh, gamma plus uh, lambda, uh, B transpose lambda uh, is strictly negative where gamma equal to zero. Okay. Um, and now the, the, the main thing is that you can always take such a certificate um, and uh, make it supported on only like n plus one, uh, like different inequalities. So, um, so what Caratiridori tells us, so this is Caratiridori's theorem, um, theorem, theorem, uh, that, or the implication of, which is you, you can assume that the support, uh, um, sort of gamma comma lambda, so the number of non-zero coefficients, uh, is at most, uh, n plus one where that's the, the size of all of the vectors, right? So, so here, um, here and here, uh, sort of every, every column uh, is in uh, Rn. So it has, um, you know, n coefficients and that's the same n, okay? So you can, you can always kind of 
post-process your, uh, uh, your um, uh, Farquhar certificate so that it's supported on at most like n plus one uh, different, different vectors. And this is the same as saying that if I have a polytope uh, and it's infeasible, there are exactly n plus one constraints that I can blame or at most n plus one constraints that I can blame that are responsible for the infeasibility of the polytope. So this implies at most n plus one constraints uh, are responsible uh, for uh, PV being empty. Okay. Um, so it's really directly a consequence in this case of character Dory's theorem when you apply it uh, to a Farquhar certificate. Um, and so what does that say? So we know that the original polytope with no branching decisions um, taken, the original polytope um, is feasible, right? You could take the all one half point or something and check that that's inside the polytope. So you definitely had to take, you know, one branching decision or something like this. Um, so, so you have to take, uh, uh, I, I mean, this, this, uh, the support of Lambda has to be like non-trivial, like you have to uh, use a new inequality. Um, but, um, you know, that what's really going to be interesting here is how many of the original inequalities I had to use. So you have to use one new inequality, you uh, use at most n plus one inequalities total. So this implies that uh, the support uh, of gamma is at most n, okay? So you have to use one new inequality, you're not going to use more than n plus one. Uh, so the number of original inequalities that you use, this is the, the, the number of original inequalities. is at most n. Okay, so now if we look at the picture um, uh, of, the, of the branching tree, um, I, can, I can sort of point out uh, n original uh, inequalities that were necessary uh, to make every leaf empty, right? So for every leaf node, I can point out like n original inequalities that as long as these n original inequalities are in there, the leaf node is still infeasible. So if you, if you put that all together, um, um, if I take, you know, there exists like number of leaf nodes times n, original inequalities uh, such that, um, uh, you know, well, P cap Zn or, sorry, P cap zero one to the N. Right, because basically you take the branching proof as is and all you do is that you make sure that uh, you maintain all of the original inequalities that are needed to make the leaf nodes empty. Um, but then that, that, that gives you sort of a subset of the original constraints such that the branching proof is still valid for that subset of original constraints, right? Which in particular proves that, uh, uh, you know, if I didn't, you know, possibly deleted some constraints, I would still have an infeasible system. Um, but so this gives that, you know, the number of leaf nodes, um, okay, but since sort of P is, is critical, right, I cannot delete any uh, inequality while maintaining uh, integer infeasibility that implies the n times the number of leaves, leaf nodes uh, is bigger than two to the n because that's the number of inequalities. I okay, so that's it. Um, so 
Um, yeah, Th this is, as I said, like the example that people in optimization use like all over the place because they can embed it in all sorts of hard combinatorial problems. Um, and, and we don't have like, people have not been thinking about like easy combinatorial optimization problems, which are hard for branch and bound or hard for branching proofs and this kind of stuff. And you know, that, that could be like space for people to play. Um, Cause I think in, in, in SAT, you guys are very, you know, uh, focused on finding SAT formulas that are hard. Uh, it could be that, you know, maybe it's easier or you get like more uh, leverage out of looking at some combinatorial optimization problem, which is, somehow very easy to describe, not uh, also an easy problem, but where you know our proof techniques uh, work horribly on them. Um, all right, good. Um, so that, that was that. Um, so now you guys have the, the choice of me saying something more about um, you know, either the kind of technical details associated with uh, taming uh, the coefficients of ranching proofs, or you know some more details about how you uh, convert um, these enumerative ranching proofs to cutting plane proofs. So you got someone has to tell me you know what what you would like to see. We could take um, some votes in the chat. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm thinking that we might hear in a little bit more than two weeks uh, more about three three okay good so good. starting with two and then deciding afterwards whether we should call it a day or whether we still have the energy yeah yeah let's do that let's do that so let's do let's do let's do two um so yeah i think the first thing i wanted to do is like um prove my my favorite little lemma um just to to show that um, you know, this is, let's say, the main tool uh, that's, that's, uh, that's used um, to give you any leverage over, over what happens. Um, so, um, okay, so let's move on to, the, to two. So my favorite lemma. Um, what is my favorite lemma? Uh, you start with P, uh, you know, being uh, AX less than or equal to B. Uh, and you know that this is uh, this starts as being empty. So you have some some system, and you know it's empty. Um, and then what you have uh, is you look at a perturbation, perturbation, which is uh, this p epsilon, and this is um, you just add epsilon to all the right hand side. Okay. And now I say, if P epsilon is not empty, okay, so here again, you should think that this is some, you know, leaf polytope where it used to be a x s and equal to B, but then I like screwed up the proof, I perturbed everything, and I can sort of, um, I mean, in the actual proof, I perturb both the A's uh, and the B's, um, but you can fold, you know, you can basically say that the, the perturbed constraints um, imply uh, perturbed versions of the original constraints, um, and that's encoded by this epsilon. Um, and so you get now to the situation where you have, you know, all sorts of crazy different errors. Um, so should um, I think of somehow looking at this AXB inequalities? And then I'm rounding the coefficients and I'm somehow estimating, I mean, I'm rounding carefully, but still I'm picking up some error. And then I yes. somehow take the worst possible error and like fold it into this epsilon thingy. Exactly, yes. I mean, basically what will happen is that, uh, I mean, just as a as I said, you'll really have like some, you know, kind of A prime X, like less than or equal to B prime or something like this. Um, so maybe let's you know look at the first one like some a one prime x is equal to b prime, um, and then you know to you want to say that this uh, this implies um, you know so this is the perturbed version of the original inequality. This is uh, somehow perturbed uh, and actually and scaled. This is one of the um, 
the non-trivial things, a uh, scaled version of A1, uh, and you have the same thing here. Okay, so you, you have to scale and, 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 and perturb and whatnot. And you would like this to imply something like A1x uh, less than or equal to B1 plus epsilon. Uh, now, uh, of course, you know, one linear inequality can never just by itself imply uh, a completely different uh, linear inequality unless they're parallel. Um, so, so this is under the assumption that, you know, this is under the assumption that, let's say, you know, the norm of X is bounded by R. Okay, so, you know, and, and you know, how would you prove, you know, such a thing? Um, it would be like some stupid Cauchy-Schwartz, right? Like it's like, um, uh, you know, you would know, for example, let's, um, let's maybe kind of work this out just a tiny bit because this is the kind of error that shows up, you know, all the time, um, right? So maybe you know that like, uh, 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 um, okay, like alpha times uh, A1 prime uh, minus A1, let's say, you know, this, this, is, this is less than some uh, delta. Okay. Um, okay. So so let's say you 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 know this, um, and uh, uh, similarly, okay. Let's like even make the assumption that both things are true. That like, um, um, yeah. Let's make the the same assumption here. That sort of um, B. Uh, B1 minus alpha B1 prime, let's say an absolute value is, is also less than delta. Okay, but this delta can be kind of big, um, but it's, it's bound. Uh, the thing is that A1 is gigantic. So I'm, I'm scaling down something small, uh, you know, that's a bounded size. This could still be, still be gigantic. Um, but you know, what does this imply if I have a, a norm bound on, uh, on X? Um, so you kind of just do the, the most trivial possible thing. So you have like a one X, um, and you add and subtract, um, sort of one, uh, minus alpha a one, um, X plus. Uh, yes, uh, plus uh, alpha uh, A1 X. Uh, and now, you know, you use Cauchy Schwartz here. So, um, and now, uh, so here, what I will use is I know this, uh, sorry, this is prime, prime, prime. Uh, I use the assumption here, so this is at most uh, B prime, uh, B one prime, um, and and then uh, 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 what do you get? So this is like some delta, this is some R, um, uh, this is. Um, um, uh, right at most. Indeed, uh, B1 plus delta. So in total, you get something like delta plus one times R plus B1. So this uh, would be epsilon or epsilon one. Because you do some like stupid Cauchy shorts to like fold all the error into, uh, into the right-hand side, uh, subject to knowing that your feasible region is bad. Okay, so this is um, how you, you know, this is like where these come from, where epsilon comes from. Okay, so you have some, you, you know, perturbation both of A and B, you use boundedness to turn that into just a perturbation of B. Uh, and that's, you know, a, a useful simplification. And for that, you do need some boundedness. Um, okay. So, so uh, okay, that was kind of a little bit of, uh, of an aside as to like where this epsilon comes from. 
Um, but now let yes. Hi. Uh, if I just remember correctly, used L1 and L infinity for some reason. Can you say briefly why? Um, just because like the Diophantian approximation is like more naturally, uh, or at least the, 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 the basic proofs are, are kind of um, give L infinity guarantees. So then the dual of that is L1. But uh, I mean, to yeah, these things are all the same. I mean, at the end of the day, like they're all off by factors of square root of dimension, but uh, they, 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 they will disappear in the asymptotics. Um, yeah, but, but yes, I mean, the only reason is because the natural normalization for the, the Diophantian approximation was L infinity. Um, okay. Um, good. So, so let me kind of restart, uh, uh, from okay, so we have our perturbation now of our original system. We sort of convince ourselves that it makes sense to think of only perturbations of the right hand side. Uh, but uh, I mean, maybe as you can see from the derivation of where these perturbations come from, they can be like arbitrarily large, um, they can be all over the place, um, and mostly because the A's are can be arbitrarily large. So, so it's it's not like you have obvious quantitative control over epsilon. Um, I mean, you have some, but but it's 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 not one hundred percent obvious what it is. Um, so so now let's continue from star. So so if your uh, p epsilon polytope is is not empty, uh, so it's not equal to the empty set, uh, you can find a, an influential constraint. So there exists an influential constraint. I and M such that if I um, if I replace, if I kind of improve the error on only this one constraint, I can make the polytope empty. So how do I uh, encode that? Um, I write it like this. Okay, so this, um, uh, okay, so exists an influential constraint. Here I should say, I mean, it, it should be kind of obvious that the, um, 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 like epsilon i is going to be positive. Okay, so the error on this constraint will in fact be positive. So it could be, by the way, that, that this, uh, these epsilons uh, in the way I wrote it, some of them could in fact be negative. Um, so there could be some constraints that, in fact, you know, you you the perturbation does better than the original constraints. Um, but okay, in general, you don't know this, and it's possible, of course, that all of the epsilons are positive. So so you have really uh, error uh, in 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 a net, in a bad way um, on all the constraints. Okay, but but the the, the lemma does not assume this. Um, and so what this says is that there's one constraint where you know the epsilon, the error was epsilon i, and if you switch the error from being epsilon i to being minus n epsilon i, so so you massively kind of uh, you make a, a sort of quite non-trivial improvement. Um, so it goes way past where it needs to be to be at the original error level, which is epsilon i equals zero. Um, but if you can make this massive improvement. Um, then the polytope will be empty. So, so why is this true? Okay, so this is, this is useful, useful. Why is this true? Uh, the reason it'll be true is because of Farquhar's lemma. Uh, and it's, it's very, it's like, it's almost two lines. So, so, okay, so by Farquhar's. Right, there exists lambda positive. Uh, such that that that's a, a proof of infeasibility of the original polytope, right? So such that lambda transpose a equals zero, uh, and uh, lambda uh, transpose b is strictly negative. Okay. And now, where does the kind of n or n plus one come from? And 
such that uh, this is uh, by Caratiridori. Caratiridori, uh, you the support of lambda, or the size of the support is at most. Um, I think in this case you can even do it. Uh, no, I think you, you know it's going to be at plus one. So. Um, Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so um, um, what's going on? What's going on here? Um, so, so all we're going to do is we're going to like stare at the far crash certificate that has small support, um, and we're going to like use that to pick out uh, one inequality, one perturbed inequality that um, uh, we have to improve to um, um, make the new polytope empty. And we're going to use the far crash certificate to guarantee that the new polytope is empty, right? So, so we start with our P epsilon and we say it's not empty. Okay, I mean, if it was empty, there's nothing to do. But so what, what do we do? We just like stare at what that means for the far crash certificate. So this implies, of course, that if I take the same far crash certificate, um, that implies the following: that if I look at you know sort of you know bi plus um, uh, epsilon i, uh, that this is bigger than or equal to zero, because otherwise the whole thing you know would be uh, would be would be empty. Um, so what are, what are we going to do? Uh, let's look at i star. Um, and let that be just the art max. Um, uh, sort of lambda i epsilon i. Right. Um, so this will be the inequality that we want to improve. Okay. So this will be the, the influential. Okay. And it should be clear that, like, I mean, I has to be in the support, obviously. I star has to be in the support of, of lambda, because otherwise, you know, uh, um, right. I mean, it's, it's clear that, like, uh, I star is in the support of lambda. Uh, and um, um, uh, epsilon I star is strictly positive, right? Because otherwise, uh, this uh, if if uh, if this was zero, uh, then um, you know these sum of lambda i epsilon i's would sum up to zero, and uh, because you already had a far crash certificate, you know this total sum would have to be negative. So so this this much has to happen if I know that my polytope is uh, is infeasible. Uh, and now, you know, let's just look at, you know, epsilon prime, uh, which is, uh, uh, okay, so I wrote it in this kind of funny way, it was epsilon minus, you know, n plus one, epsilon i, uh, standard basis vector ei, but all, all this is saying, this is equivalent to saying that, you know, epsilon prime i uh, is equal to epsilon i for all kind of i not equal to, sorry, uh, this is i star i star. Uh, I star um, and epsilon uh, I star is um, minus n uh, epsilon I star, right? That's, uh, that's all this epsilon prime is. Okay, and now let's convince ourselves that, you know, um, so we want to show that P, you know, epsilon prime is empty. Um, and we can do that by just evaluating, you know, the Farkash certificate and hoping, you know, to see that, that when you evaluate the Farkash certificate, you in fact get uh, a certificate of infeasibility for P epsilon prime. Um, so, you know, suffice is to check that um, lambda uh, is Far crash certificate in, uh, right, is far crash certificate of infeasibility. 
right? And for this purpose, we just uh, check. So what do we get? Um, so, I mean, clearly, like, you know, the first constraint on lambda, you know, I haven't changed lambda at all. So like, this is clearly still satisfied. So the only thing I have to check is this second part. Um, so, you know, we look at uh, lambda uh, transpose B plus now epsilon prime, right? And so what do we get? Um, we're going to get, if you write it out, you're going to get the following. You're going to get lambda transpose B, right? And this uh, we know is already strictly negative. Then you're going to get sort of lambda transpose um, the original epsilon, okay? And uh, then you're going to get the difference between the original epsilon and epsilon prime, which is kind of minus n plus one uh, lambda i star epsilon i star, okay? Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, what, what, do, what do we know? Uh, we know that this, because of the first term, is strictly smaller than, than, than this. Um, okay, and now, um, you know, uh, remember that uh, this has support n plus one, and, and this is the kind of arg max term. Right, so this is clearly smaller than like, you know, n plus one times the arg max term minus, the, you know, the same thing. Right, which is just equal to zero. Um, so there, there are most n plus one terms by, uh, you know, the fact that we, we chose our Farquhar certificate using Kara Teodori, um, where we, we kind of massaged it to make sure it's only supported on n plus one things. Um, and because we chose the, M, you know, the arg max term to kind of improve um, <clears throat> by a lot, the improvement is so much that it, it counterbalances all the other errors. Um, and uh, uh, so note that there is a strict inequality here. So this really does imply that, you know, lambda transpose, you know, B plus epsilon prime is strictly negative, which means you have a valid uh, Farquhar certificate. Right, and that's, that's the proof. Um, what is nice, I mean, the cool, the important thing about, you know, this like influential constraint is that, you know, it, the amount by which you need to improve the error on that constraint is like independent of all the other constraints, right? Like I can kind of uh, stare at, at, at one constraint in isolation uh, uh, to some extent. And if I can improve any one constraint uh, like in isolation, then I can always find one such so that if I improve just that one, I make the polytope infeasible. Um, so, uh, you know, why, why would this be like something reasonable, right? So like, you know, uh, so, so I have some constraint A1, you know, X less than B1 plus epsilon, you know, assume this is influential, assume this is the, the influential one. Um, and now I basically say, okay, if I manage to, uh, re, you know, uh, replace by A1, you know, X less than or equal to B1 minus N epsilon one, you know, now, uh, you know, uh, we have infeasibility. So now we have infeasibility. Okay, so why is, is going from here to here reasonable? Or why would you expect this kind of thing to happen? Uh, like um, in, in the context of, of these branching proofs. Um, so remember that, um, 
you know, remember that, that uh, okay, so here is like our, let's say this is a bound on our feasible region. Okay, so everything lives inside some ball or L1 ball or whatever ball of radius R. Um, and, um, you know, what the, the, I have some like, let's say minuscule branch. Okay, I'm very bad at drawing here. Um, this is like, you know, A1, let's say X less than or equal to B1 on, on the left side. Uh, yeah, A1, like X less than or equal to B1. And then I have A, you know, uh, one X greater than or equal to B1 plus one on the right side. But so, you know, imagine that A1 is so big that, you know, this B1 and B1 plus one are, you know, the, the, the two hyperplanes are basically right, you know, super, super close to each other. There's, you know, there's no width uh, in between them. Um, and we're going to try and approximate it, right? So we're going to try um, and, uh, and approximate it with some A1 prime. So we want, let's approximate A1 by a, A1 prime, which is uh, much shorter. Okay, so, and now let's like draw the hyperplanes that you get for A1 prime. Like what do the, the, the hyperplanes, uh, the integer hyperplanes look like? So um, here, you know, would be like a candidate picture. Um, so um, good. So you would have something, you would have some picture like this. Like, okay, so these are, you know, th this would be, um, a1 prime x equal to, I don't know, uh, I'll make up numbers, uh, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. These are what the, you know, approximating uh, uh, hyperplanes might look like. Um, and you can sort of see that, uh, in, in fact, I, I, could, I can make this picture much better. Um, so um, if I had drawn this picture, this, um, you know, this could really be arbitrarily close to the, to the right-hand side, um, just like tilt things so that this is kind of arbitrarily close uh, uh, here. Uh, but maybe, okay, maybe here it's a, it's a, it's a bit maybe easier to see. Um, so, you know, the, the issue is um, I, I need to approximate both sides of the branch. So, and I need to pick like two, um, you know, consecutive uh, uh, hyperplanes um, to, to form the, the new approximating branch. So I could, you know, pick, um, you know, these two, or I could pick maybe these two, right? So I could say the new approximate branch is either um, sort of uh, A1 prime X less than or equal to two or greater than or equal to three, or I could pick this one. Right, it's um, it's 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 not clear which one I should pick. Um, actually, in the construction, it will be clear, but just for the sake of this particular picture, it's not exactly clear. Um, and here you can see that you know, like, um, you can always pick it so that one side of the branch does way better than what it needs to do. Okay, so like, um, let's say I pick. Uh, so if I pick new uh, approximate branch to be like A1 prime X uh, less than or equal to one or greater than or equal to two. So the, the less than or equal to one side is here, right? And that does way, way, way better than, um, you know, uh, uh, a one x less than or equal to b one, right? So, so I'm all the way like, you know, on on the left hand side of the branch, 
I'm way past, you know, uh, I'm way past here. So way past. So, so on one side, I'm doing like fantastic, but it's on the other side that I have the problem, right? On the other side, um, so for the, the A1 prime X greater than or equal to two, you know, it's like not so good. Right, because here I sort of cut through, um, like I would need to be here, um, but I'm only doing kind of good at this part, but then on this part, um, I'm including all sorts of stuff that wasn't there originally, right? I mean, um, this is the original branch, so I'm kind of doing good on the top and bad on the bottom, right? But you can see that if I, if I move by just one, Right. If I'm if I'm kind of uh, you know if I if I move by just one, so I, I change uh, two to three, for example, uh, then I do way better than what I needed to do. Right. So you you the thing that kind of happens is that um, when you're trying to convert the branching proof, you know you have to do well on both sides. You always do, you can sort of convince yourself that you always do pretty well on one or the other side, um, you know, depending on the situation. And it should also be clear that like, if I was, you know, able to make one more branch, um, uh, I, I can, um, so if I branched on, um, you know, A1X uh, greater or equal to three or A1X less than or equal to one, I can do way, way better than the original inequality. So this is where this kind of like, the ability to improve an inequality comes from, is that I can, I can always add an additional branch um, using you know, the, approximate, uh, uh, the approximations of A1 to do um, sort of way better than, than I need to do. Um, the issue is that there is always this like one kind of hyperplane that I need to take care of where you know my approximation quality is, is not so good or possibly even terrible. Um, and so that's, uh, that's just kind of a little bit of the picture of like, you know, why adding or subtracting one to your branching decision can, can massively improve the error. Um, but you need to, to always do good in this like hyperplane that you know, intersects through the feasible, uh, through the branch, uh, the original branch. Okay. Um, so, so that's a bit about like why this kind of, you know, situation might be reasonable. Um, let me say a word about how we use Diophantine approximation or like what we need uh, of the approximations uh, uh, that we create. Okay, so, you know, um, so we have uh, our branch, um, a1, you know, um, a1x less than or equal to b1 or, or greater or equal to b1 plus one. And the question is, uh, when we replace, when we do the replacement, um, so when we do a replacement, Uh, what is it sir what makes uh, this a good you know replacement Right, that's really like somehow the question that, 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 that one has to answer. Um, so I can use all the like fancy kind of Diophantine approximation uh, uh, machinery that, that, that you want, but you have to answer this question, right? You have to know like, why, why was it useful? What did this, um, you know, what, what, what did this thing achieve uh, that, that was somehow going to help you in the end, at the very end, 
uh, show or create, you know, proofs that all of the, the, the leaf polytopes are, 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 are empty or can be made empty, right? So, you know, for this purpose, uh, it's actually more useful to, uh, instead of talking about the iterated Diophantine approximation that we use, like we can abstract out the properties uh, that, that, that we need of A prime um, that um, kind of tell you exactly what's going to happen. Um, and then you can sort of believe that, you know, these properties can be achieved by Diophantine approximation, but that's kind of a very messy and like annoying, you know, uh, numerical computation, but, but, you know, let's, let's see what the actual properties are. Okay, so here are the properties. So, we need, so what's really gonna happen, uh, uh, I think it's kind of useful to kind of look at the form of what these A1 prime, uh, A1 prime is going to look like, and then it, it'll sort of, be be more clear that 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 um, like what what we might need. So it'll turn out that sort of a one prime is going to um, um, look something like this. It'll look um, something like this. Um, uh, dark a j a one. I don't know. I is okay. Okay, A1i uh, times M to the K minus I. And um, A1 prime will equal something like this. So uh, B1i times M to the K minus I. Where what, what, what exactly is going on? Um, and M will be something like um, N R to the order N. Okay, so what? So this this is not quite yet the properties we need. Maybe this is like um, maybe I should say this is more precisely the shape, um, which will then help you see why the properties I'm going to need in a second makes sense. This is the the, the shape uh, of A prime B prime. Okay. So what should you um, what should you think here is that like uh, kind of a one um, one and b one one um, are like um, or maybe let's just stick to a one uh, the direction okay let's just say that a one one is like the you know highest order bit. Uh, of uh, direction of A1. And, uh, you know, then if you keep going down, then sort of A1K will be like the lowest order bit. Okay, um, and what's important, of course, is that these AIs, um, you know, these AIs will all be reasonably short. A, these A1Is uh, will all have norm uh, at most sort of some NR to the order N uh, as well. And they, 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 they will be taken, um, they will come from Diophantine approximation, like somehow, you first Diophantine approximate uh, uh, A1 uh, and you get A11. Uh, and then you kind of project out what you get. Uh, and then um, you Diophantine approximate the projection and you continue and so on and so forth. And you sort of get like um, an iterated uh, uh, sequence of Diophantine approximations, each of which is capturing like, um, you know, different order information about the direction of, of, of A. Um, so, so this is, I guess, the, the kind of the shape that there are these like many little component pieces. Uh, and the sort of idea is that, that you should have in your mind 
um, is that if you look at um, um, uh, yeah, if you look at the kind of this corresponding branch, so the um, a one i x less than or equal to um, uh, b one i, or let's not even put the plus one at this point, um, greater than or equal to um, b one i. Um, you know, the, the plus one uh, doesn't play a role. Okay, so you can write plus one, but only for i equals k. Sort of the plus one is, is kind of irrelevant up until the very end. This is a good approximation. This is a good approx. Um, for the inequality that I want, for the branch that I want, restricted to the subspace that uh, has um, everybody else equal. Okay, so, so, so in some sense, I, um, I, I'm, I'm building this kind of like iterated, you know, approximation of, of the original branch. And what I want is that the new pieces, each new bit of information that I get is kind of a good approximation for the branch uh, in, the, in the full space. Um, but when I restrict um, to the subspace where I set um, like all these like little previous approximations uh, exactly equal. Um, so, so this is kind of like how the, these things are constructed. Um, but so now what is it that, that like I want them to satisfy? So, you know, what properties now do I need? Uh, and now let me focus here just on one uh, inequality because it's a, it's a, it's a bit easier. Um, so, so notice that you have this a one prime, you have this b one prime, and then you have like all of its like little constituent building blocks. Um, and these building blocks all together, uh, I will need all of the all of the building blocks, and I will need some joint property of everything together. Uh, and so, what we're going to say is that. Um, like this A1 prime, B1 prime, sort of A1, B1, A2, B2, sort of all of these things together, AK, BK, are um, you know, a, a valid, what I would call substitution sequence, substitution sequence. And let's just look at one side of the inequality for A1. Uh, oh, um, yeah, you know what? Um, I'm going to, there are too many subscripts, so I'm going to drop one of them. Um, yeah, there, 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 there were two subscripts and everything above. Let me just drop one subscript and let me just assume, you know, the, the original inequality has no subscript, uh, just so that um, I, I keep the notation under control. So, so let's just look at one side of the branch. Okay, so I'm actually going to need something to hold simultaneously for both sides of the branch, but like for, for one, you know, for, for one second, let's just keep one side of the branch in mind. And um, so I, I, I have all these little constituent building blocks and I want them to, to use them to kind of replace uh, in some sense, um, the inequality AX less than or equal to B. Um, now, when I do the initial replacement, I'm replacing it by um, A1 prime X less than or equal to B1 prime, but I'm going to need more when we get to the leaf polytopes. 
So this, this substitution is, is something that uh, uh, is sort of a, a one prime, B one prime is like the first pass approximation, which I will then improve uh, using the, the building blocks um, by adding cuts essentially. Um, but so what, what does this mean? Um, so I'm gonna say you have a valid substitution sequence and you have error levels, okay, with error levels. Let's say gamma one greater than or equal to gamma two, da, 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 greater than or equal to gamma k, and gamma k is zero. So that corresponds to zero error. Um, so I just want to say this and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of connect it to um, this, like my favorite lemma, and then we'll stop. Um, so, what are the three, you know, the three properties that, that, that we need is the following it says, okay, so for uh, all indices, uh, so let's say uh, for all um, L in K, and uh, for any short uh, X, so for any X that is not too large, what I want is the following things. So the first property is that um, this is true. So if I have this inequality, and I have uh, all the previous inequalities, all the kind of building block inequalities um, at equality. Um, yeah, uh, for all i in l minus one. So I, I have you know the substituted inequality in the system, um, and I've uh, managed to learn like l minus one equations, um, which correspond to like exactly learning, you know, the building block uh, uh, equalities, um, then this is going to imply um, that AX, so the actual inequality I want to learn uh, is, is valid, but with error gamma L. Okay. So the more equations I learn, the better the error gets. Okay, so, so, um, if I have no equations, um, um, so that means I just have a prime x less than or equal to b prime, um, I still have some initial error level, which is gamma one, okay? Um, and when I have, um, you know, k minus one equations, I have error level gamma k, which is zero, which means that once I've learned these k equations from the building blocks, I've exactly learned uh, the, the original inequality. Um, the second property I need is the following. It says that um, if this is basically saying if I branch on one of the building block inequalities, um, and hopefully it will be somewhat clear how this connects um, to, to my favorite lemma. Then what do I know? Um, so, so, yeah, okay. So, so the, the first inequality sort of says that, you know, uh, this initial way I replaced, um, you know, AX less than or equal to B. Again, remember that at some point I need to have a way, I, I, I need to be able to argue about AX less than or equal to B and greater than or equal to B plus bum, but we're just kind of sticking with one side. Um, and we should believe that somehow both sides will be dealt with in the same way. Um, but here what you see is that the, the uh, original replacement of uh, AX less than or equal to B, which is A prime X less than or equal to B prime, um, it, it gives me some error, which is gamma one. Then I set a few things equal, I, I managed to set a few things equal um, that are in, in you know, the building blocks in some sense of A prime and the error drops, okay? And now what I'm saying is that if I'm allowed uh, to branch on uh, the AL direction um, and I'm allowed to kind of branch of AL less than or equal to, to B one minus one, then I improve the error 
from you know gamma l to minus n times gamma l, right? So sort of if uh, uh, a x less than or equal to b was the influential inequality, um, this is what is giving me the flexibility uh, to sort of massively improve the error uh, to make the leaf polytope empty. Um, then I also need uh, uh, the, the, the following, that if I have a prime x less than or equal to b prime and a i uh, x equal to b i for all i in l minus one, uh, this implies that uh, a l x is strictly less than b l plus one. Okay, so these are these are the, the, the three the three properties I need. So let's just like um, th think about like what this uh, what this could help with. So let's assume that you know you have your um, original poly. Uh, let's say you have your leaf polytope. Um, uh, Ax. Um, Okay, let's let's even write it. Ah, okay, uh, fine, whatever. Uh, a x less than or equal to b. Um, and now, you know, we we have we have our our our, our errors. So this is the the perturbed polytope. Perturbed polytope uh, at, uh, in the new proof. Uh, that's like this. And let's assume that it's always the first inequality that's influential. You know, assume, you know, A1 kind of X less than or equal to kind of, you know, B1 plus uh, Epsilon one uh, is always influential, always the influential inequality. All right, I'm going to keep improving it uh, uh, and to make it influential. So in, in the above kind of definition of a substitution sequence, um, you know, uh, in above, um, let's say, uh, think of epsilon one as being sort of gamma one, and think of a one as, you know, uh, a one x less than or equal to b one is uh, a x less than or equal to b. Okay, just, you know, this is notationally speaking, I'm dropping um, the one uh, 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 subscript. Um, so, so, so this is this is the starting situation. So I have um, um, a one prime less than or equal to b one uh, less than or equal to b prime in the system, which gives me kind of this initial error level. So how can I um, sort of start adding cuts to to make things empty? Um, so let's just like point out what's going to happen. Um, so this at, at level one of, of, of recursion in some sense um, basically is, is what gives me this. Now, what does uh, part two tell me? Um, part two tells me that if I, um, you know, oh, I, I really uh, I, I tried to simplify notation, but I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm going to do anyone any favors. Um, Okay, well, we'll just try and stick with it. Um, so, um, okay, really, uh, let's just forget that A1 has an index and think of this as the inequality. So what does two tell me at first level? It says, if I branch, if I branch on uh, A1x less than or equal to B1, but this is uh, this is this uh, a one here is uh, this a one. Um, sorry, b one minus one. Um, this will imply that um, sort of the actual a x is less or equal to um, b minus n gamma one, um, and uh, because this is influential, it will imply that the leaf polytope is empty.
um, is empty. Okay, so with this new inequality, the leaf polytope will be empty. Um, so uh, uh, good. Now, um, um, what does three give me? What does three give me? Um, it says, if I branch, on uh, A1x greater than or equal to B1 plus one, um, then this will be trivially empty, right? Because already this inequality implies, already basically this inequality by itself implies, you know, that, that uh, um, A1x is strictly less than B1, right? So, um, you know, property three, um, I mean, you know, already know um, and that's uh, because of uh, of the fact that a prime x is less than or equal to b prime is in the system. Right? So that implies, uh, emptiness again. And so the only thing, uh, so, so I have two branches which are kind of immediately empty. So there's only one thing left, right? Uh, only one branch left. Uh, which corresponds to um, a1x equal b1. So in, in, in essence, what happens is that the properties of this like substitution sequence sort of tell me like, um, you know, if I branch on this like constituent block um, of, of a prime, then if I branch one way, I'm empty. If I branch another way, I'm also empty. And so the only kind of non-empty branch that will be left will be sort of exactly at the quality. Um, but this allows you to recurse because somehow this definition is recursive. It sort of says, uh, you know, once you've learned some inequalities, the same pattern repeats again. I have a new inequality that uh, I can use like A2 uh, branch on A2, and then I'll have three choices for A2, one of which, both two of which will be empty and the third one corresponding to learning the exact equality. Um, so, so basically that's, that's the, the pattern. That you basically ensure that for every leaf polytope, for every inequality you have in the leaf polytope, you have a valid substitution sequence. And you know, depending on which inequality ends up being influential, um, you you branch. So you branch on the appropriate thing for each influential inequality. Two branches will be empty. Third branch will be uh, sort of an exact equality, uh, and you recurse inductively. Um, and if you kind of think about what's happening, uh, it, it's basically equivalent to adding sort of a CG cut uh, in the direction in this, what I was just showing here, um, the process of, of, of learning inequality is exactly the same as adding a CG cut in the direction of A1 and in the direction of minus A1. So, you know, you kind of like, uh, okay, I think uh, my, my hands, okay, no, you can sort of see them. Like you, you do a CG cut this way and a, uh, a CG cut that way, but for the same normal uh, in, in two different directions. And then you learn an equation and repeat. Um, so I, I think that's probably about as much as uh, I should say. Um, but that, yeah, this is, this is the kind of main, um, you know, technical property you, you sort of need of how you build um, these approximations. It's kind of finicky and involved, but at the end, I think you know it's uh, it's 
it's not so so bad once you you see the abstraction, but it's uh, it's still a bit tech quite technical. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Let's see, I. Uh... It's, is there anything in the chats? Um, or is that old? No. no. So let's no, no. see. Any questions from the audience at this point? I think we've you worked long and hard, so we should uh, you know cut you some slack. But if there are any final questions, I think you sort of get a yeah. I think it's helpful to get us. I'm I'm at least fooling myself into that I get a sense of kind of sort of what's going on and then obviously reading the paper to figure out the details, but yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, uh, I I'd say it was surprisingly, yeah, difficult to, to, to get the whole thing to work, uh, for, for the coefficient reduction. Like, so when Noah and company, you know, asked me these questions, I, I, I thought like, Oh, like applied Daphantine approximation, like, you'll be done. Uh, but you really have to apply Diophantine approximation sort of very, very, very carefully to achieve exactly the right properties. And then you need to use a little bit of LP theory to like help you out. Um, yeah. But I mean, at least given uh, Noah's new result, it does say that, you know, being able to achieve more substantial coefficient reductions would clearly help with lower bounds. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's a tricky problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I definitely think like, like somehow in the coefficient reduction strategy, I have like this, um, uh, ba, 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 where is it? Uh, yes. Like the reason why we get like, uh, coefficients of size, you know, two to the n squared, um, is basically because of this big M, like this gigantic. So you have this like big M that's just trying to like separate the. Um, um, so you you know like if you have like a binary expansion, right? The the binary expansion kind of separates the different the power of the different terms to tell you that you know the leading term is way more powerful than all the other terms combined um and to kind of get that appropriate separation you 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 get this like uh power of m to the power n which gives you two to the m squared but it seems like you know a bit of a a very wasteful, like there should be like a better way of doing this that that doesn't require um, such a coarse way of separating the effect of the different levels of approximation. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that just seems like there should be room for improvement there. Um, I, I think if you stare at that long and hard, you might get like an n to the n uh, uh, upper bound. I have no idea how you would get anything close to what uh, Noah and company need, which would be sub-exponential um, on the coefficient sets. Mm -hmm. So uh, on behalf of all listeners, I'll give you the symbolic round of applause. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot. This was great. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, lots and lots of uh, interesting questions to think about and, and uh, directions in which to go further and to you know, either tighten things up or, or, I mean, get lower bounds for stabbing planes or sep separate stabbing planes and cutting planes. Which right, in any way, yeah. I don't know if we've, yeah, it's, uh, lots of good questions. Anyway, I think it's... Uh, you worked long and hard enough. Uh, yes, it's thank you. For it today. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Uh, if you want, I can uh, send you slides and all this kind of stuff. <laughs>